being recorded. It's all yours. Good afternoon and welcome to the All Bug Good and Bad series. I'm Ken Creel, Regional Extension Agent with the Alabama Cooperative Extension System. This webinar, as well as all of the others, will be recorded and posted for later viewing. Please take a few minutes at the end of the presentation to complete the evaluation at the link that will be provided on the last slide. Today's webinar is Management of Japanese Beetles and Other White Grubs and will be presented by Dr. J.C. Chong. Dr. Chong is an associate professor and extension specialist in the Department of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences at Clemson University. Dr. Chong joined Clemson University in April 2007 as a turf and ornamental entomologist with 60% research and 40% extension responsibilities in turf grass and ornamental plant production. He earned his bachelor's degree in ecology and evolutionary biology from the University of Arizona in 1999 and he earned his Master's of Science degree in Entomology in 2001 from the University of Georgia and his Ph.D. in Entomology in 2005 from the University of Georgia. His research focuses on the integrative management of insects and mites damaging turf grass and ornamental plants. He is particularly interested in the management of scale insects and wood boring insects on ornamental plants and bill bugs, Bermuda grass mites, and scarab beetles in turf grass systems. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Chong, and thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us today. Thank you, Ken. Uh, let's get the uh, show started. All right, good afternoon, everybody. And I imagine everybody is calling in from around the country. Uh, in South Carolina, uh, we are dealing with uh, quite a bit of uh, white grubs. But the uh, white grub species that we have in South Carolina is probably going to be very different from what you got in um, Iowa or Oregon or somewhere else. Uh, so the experience is going to be a little bit different. But So what I'm going to talk about is based on my experience here in South Carolina and you know, very much in the South. But some of the general principle is going to be applicable to the rest of the country. Uh, if you do have questions, please do, uh, do type in the chat box and uh, Kathy will try to answer that. And or I could just try to answer that along the way. So uh, let's get started. Let's talk about Japanese beetles. And um, again, you have my uh, telephone numbers and my email address on the screen. Do feel free to contact me if you like. Um, I can talk about just about anything. Uh, being an extension, extension specialist, uh, I'm trained to talk for five on stop, so be careful what you wish for. All right, let's see. All right, Japanese beetles. You guys are familiar with that, I hope. Um, this is the adult. But today, uh, I'm not going to focus on too much on the, on the adult. Instead, I'm going to talk mainly about the white grubs. And, of course, adult can cause a lot of problems. Uh, it can other women up all by itself, just to talk about the management of, of the adults. So I'm just going to skip that. I'm uh, going to talk about white grubs. And this is the very typical white grubs that you're going to be seeing in the field and feeding on your turf grass, feeding on your trees, and different kind of uh, seeds. And let's talk about something a little bit more general, which is the successful management of white grubs really requires you to have a good understanding of what it really takes to achieve the best result. Now, this seems to be a very simple statement, but it actually has a lot of caviar in it, if you, if you say, really, understanding. What do I mean by understanding? Understanding really has a lot of layers in it. Well, the first thing you need to ask is, what kind of insect is really causing the trouble? Is it really white grubs, or is it something else? In fact, we'll talk about it a little bit later. In fact, a lot of time, what people think is a white grub damage, in fact, turns out to be diseases. So. The first step in any kind of management is knowing what is causing the problem. And from there, you can figure out what kind of management um, is needed. And also, you know, uh, know about biology, is vulnerability, and is uh, what kind of infestation level you can stand, and all that. We talk about this, and, you know, a lot of time when we look at a golf course or lawn, and there's a big old brown patch in the middle of the green field, and a lot of time there, well, is that really is that really white grubs? 
It could be something else. It could be fertilizer burn. If some of the client might be a little bit too over jealous about putting out fertilizer, and that could cause problems. And fertilizer burn could be a problem as well. And in the south right now, we are having a little bit of uh, dry weather. So drought or irrigation, not enough of it, so cause a problem. Disease could certainly be one of it. Uh, mowing height, if you some of the grass has very specific mowing height, if you mow it too short, you might either end up having that brown scab on on your lawn. And of course, other other animals could do the same thing. Uh, dog might decide to take their business onto the grass, then you're going to have a brown patch. That might not be necessary because of white grass. And a lot of other insects could also cause uh, similar issues. Now, look at this picture. This is basically a Bermuda grass lawn with a lot of little tunnels with sand pushing up to the surface. And would that be something that's caused by the white grubs? Uh, probably not. Now, one thing about insects is a lot of the insect pests, when they do damage to the white gr uh, to the turf grass or to the ornamental plants, um, they usually have very distinctive damage. In, we have a small tunnels with sand pushed to the top. Well, most likely is a mole cricket. For those of you that live further up north that doesn't have any experience with mole cricket, trust me, you don't want them. That is a pain to deal with. Let's see. Let's go back to the previous uh, picture. Now, again, most of the time, any kind of insects causing damage, there's usually a very distinctive damage uh, symptoms that's associated with the, with the infestation. Now, symptoms for the white grubs infestation, particularly this kind, of inf uh, this kind of symptoms are most evident in the summer or when there's a drought situation. Uh, that would include gradual yellowing and weakening and also thinning of your turf and brown patch, um, persistent or sun wilting of the turf despite irrigation. That's because the, the white grub basically feed on the root and when the roots are gone, um, the, it's much more susceptible to drying. Uh, spongy turf, uh, when you have a lot of white grubs tunneling underneath the soil, you stand on it, it could be a little bit uh, spongy. And also another thing, the last symptom is basically, you, you probably heard a lot is, be easily pulled up. What it means is that the roots are all gone. And so you can just kind of grab onto the turf and just kind of, without any kind of root angling the turf to the soil. Now, if you have a turf that's easily pulled up, that means that's almost a terminal stage of any kind of white, gr white grubs infestation. By that time, uh, it's a little bit too late to do a lot of pest management uh, um, exercise. And look at this picture. Um, does it look like a white grub, means, uh, white grub infestation to you? It could be. Now, a lot of insects, they, all, they, they damage the turf itself, but they also cause some other damage more indirect. For example, in this case, uh, these are actually a lawn dig up by um, some kind of big animal. Could be raccoon. Could be down here in the south. We have opossum that would do that. Armadillo would do that as well. And also hawks, feral hawks would do the same thing. So you ended up having animals that is coming in to dig up the just to look for the grubs as food. So you have almost like a secondary damage to your turf. Uh, because of the white grub in the station. Now, the, when you figure out uh, what kind of, uh, when you look at the damage and you suspect that it might be white, white grubs, uh, there are a lot of ways you can figure it out. One of the ways to figure out for sure is to call your local extension person, your agent or your plant problem, problem, plant problem diagnostic service can also help to actually identify what kind of problem that you have. It could be it could be, um, it could be that the uh, the brown patch might be caused by disease into this wall, and did not find any kind of white grubs. You, it's probably a good idea for you to take some of the samples and send it to your plant problem clinic uh, for identification, just to see whether it's actually something else. Uh, turf can have a lot of issues. White grubs is only one, of them. so you need to kind of figure out what that might be. So um, let's talk about monitoring of the uh, of the white grubs. Now, what I mentioned here is scarab beetles. 
scarab beetles are basically the adults of white grubs. The, the white grubs are basically the the uh, the larvae of this scarab beetle. There are a lot of species of scarab beetles out there, and in South Carolina, um, we have oh 100, 200 something species of scarab beetles out there. Uh, most of them are very very small, kind kind of like those Antinias and Aphodias on the right hand side of the uh, of the screen. These are little tiny little that a lot of time you will not even find them anywhere. Let me see if I can move that. There you go. Those are the little guys. Um, huge number and huge number of species, but not every single one of them is um, damaging. But one reason why you need to monitor for scarab beetle is figuring out what species that's out there. Some of them can be, can be an issue, some of them not, not much. And down here, most of these other species are the pest species. Those are the ones they need to pay more attention to. The second reason why you need to monitor for the uh, scarab beetle, or, uh, the white grub species, is figure out what kind of life stages they are. In this picture, we have the life stages of Jasmine's beetle, from eggs all the way to adult. Um, as you can see, uh, little guys, the, the white grub is down here, these three stages, and they get bigger and bigger. And one thing about monitoring for life stages is because small white grubs are a lot easier to control than big ones. When you get to big ones, they are almost impossible to kill. Now, we'll talk about management uh, later on, but just keep in mind that there's a good reason to monitor, monitor for, uh, for white grubs, for scarab beetle, just to figure out what they, how big they are and how easy they are going to be killed. The third reason is abundance. Abundance or treatment, uh, treatment threshold. Uh, if you have a sod that is full of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of white grubs, as shown in this picture, uh, you're going to have a lot of issues as far as the herb is concerned. So another thing to monitor for scarab beetle is to figure out how many they are to, and also to figure out when you need to start your treatment. We'll talk about treatment threshold in a little bit. So how do you find them? Uh, one thing, how do you monitor for white grubs? How do, how do you monitor for scarab beetle? One thing you need to be doing, uh, this, is, this is some of the tools that I think everybody should have. Doesn't matter if you're dealing with white grubs, or whether you're dealing with scale insects, or whether you're dealing with bill bugs, bone cricket, whatever. All right, so you have hand lens. Hand lens is pretty important. Do that. Hand lens is very important because uh, some of the white grub species and some of the uh, scale insects or other insect species and spider mite species, they are very, very small. So you need to know, have the hand lens or some kind of magnifying glass to actually help uh, to see some of the characteristics for you to identify what they are. And pocket knife, very important. You need a pocket knife cut into the sod to flip it over or cut a, a branch so that you can send it in for samples to take a look. And containers, some kind of containers is very important. You need that to uh, so that you can hold um, the specimen in the container and ship it off for identification. And notebook. Notebook is very important because you need to uh, write down a lot of information that you find. One thing that you find going to be, you, you're going to find very useful is what you have observed last year. If you are like me, my memory is silent, so I need to write down something. So if I write it down on the handbook, I can always refer back to it next year to figure out when the beetles become active, when did I apply the treatment last year, and how effective they are. And that sort of information I'll learn to figure out a good management project. Oh, tiny, tiny friends, I don't know if you guys can actually see it. So up here, in the corner here, uh, we have there are two, there are different ways to find the adult beetles. Adult beetles are pretty important for you to find because adults beget the white grubs. So if you know when the adults are starting to fly, then you, you can figure out uh, when to actually start the treatment. Uh, there, are, there are two major ways for you to find the adult uh, scarab beetles. One thing is the pheromone traps. There are some pheromone traps that have been developed for Japanese beetles, of course, oriental beetles as well. Some of the May and June beetle, uh, you might be able to find the pheromone for them. 
So very simple is you just hang it up somewhere, and then you can use that to uh, figure out when the adult actually become active. But what can the Japanese beetle traps actually use as a control? Uh, my answer to that is no. Uh, this is uh, very good as why they are not. When you have a very, very high infestation level, you're going to end up having filling up the entire trash bags with Japanese beetles. And then when, when these Japanese beetles overflow, guess where they're going? All these Japanese beetles overflowing, guess where they're going? They're going to go right back into the turf that you try to prevent them from going. So using a Japanese beetle trap as a control method is probably not going to work. But you could use a Japanese beetle trap as a way to tell you when they become active, as a monitoring tool instead. The second way to find the adult, uh, adult scarab beetles is in the uh, black light trap, black light trap or UV light trap. You can buy that um, commercially from some of the companies that are out there, or you can just uh, make some yourself using a UV light tube that you can buy in, in the market. The, Jap uh, the, uh, the UV light trap is great for collecting adult beetles, but they do have their shortcomings. Let me show you some of the the study that we have done in the past few years. My graduate student Kevin Henson and I uh, look at the uh, adult flight, adult Japanese beetle flight period uh, in South Carolina at four golf courses in South Carolina, just to try to figure out when they become active. Now, over a two-year period, we trap 74,000 uh, scarab beetles, and most of them are ophidians. Those are guys that we don't really care much about, but some some of them could be a problem. But look at just look at the number: seventy thousand beetles over two years. Every in the summer, when we start trapping them, a lot of time we, we might actually get in more than hundreds of them a night. So one of the biggest drawbacks of using a UV light trap is that you ended up having more beetles or more other insects that you, that you have to process. Then, then it's really worth the time. So, well, you know, Jap uh, the black light trap is great, but uh, it doesn't really uh, works as a good, easy to use um, monitoring tool. But the black light trap do collect a lot of species that are very important to us. For example, the southern mass chafers is probably one of the major pest species. The rice beetle could be an issue in some situation. Uh, black sugar cane beetle can also be a pest in the corn in some other area. Asiatic garden beetle, another pest species in the turf. Anomala, there's oriental beetle, belongs to one of those. And uh, dung beetles, well, gonna get attracted to it. May and June beetle is definitely uh, one of our major pest scarab beetle species. So they are still pretty good at collecting some of the pest species. but to actually process the large number of scarab beetles you're going to collect, uh, you, you might need more time on your hand to do that. Um, in our study, we also figured out quite a few, quite a few things about the flight period of the, uh, of the scarab beetles. The mass shapers are most active from May to July, and again, this is in South Carolina. To the, more to the north, you probably would be later, and those of you further south in Louisiana and Mississippi, you probably have it a little bit earlier. So, mass shapers, they are most active May to July. Um, let's see, Asiatic garden beetle, most active between May and September, but definitely has a peak in their activity in July. May and June beetle, the period is April to August. Their peak is May to uh, June. Japanese beetles, uh, May to August, South Carolina, but most of the individuals are collected in June. Green June beetle, July to August, and basically all your uh, basically active during June and July and June, uh, July and August uh, during those period of time. So knowing what is the peak of the activity of different scarab beetle species can give you a pretty good idea as to when you can initiate your treatment. We'll talk about that just a little bit. All right, let's talk about how to find the uh, grubs, find the wet grubs. 
Uh, can live in this world. So you kind of have to be your hands dirty, unfortunately. One way to do that, you could either use a, a cup cutters, as in this case, or use a spade. Just basically cut a cup like that, and then just break up the swirl and look for the white grubs. Or you can just uh, use a spade or a knife to cut open the side and then peel the sod back and see what you can find. So those are also ways to find it. Okay, let's talk about identification. So you you find them, you find the white grubs, and how do you know which species it is that you're looking at? Um, they just looking just based on the size of the white grubs is pretty difficult to tell because all the white grubs seem to have a very um, have a very overlap, a lot of overlapping in their, in their sizes, except for the green June beetles, perhaps. Uh, but all the white grubs have very, very distinctive patterns, hair patterns, uh, in their rear ends. The, the, uh, we'll talk about this in a little bit. Actually use a lot of these hair patterns. Uh, if you look closely, some of them seems to have, for example, the European shape first going to have that zipper looking, um, hairline right down the abdomen, I mean, right down the rear end. And Asiatic beetle have that tip right there. And some of them don't have any kind of patterns at all, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. So you can actually use the uh, rastal pattern or the hair patterns in the rear end of a white grub to figure out what species it is. Um, like I say, some of them really don't have any kind of patterns. For example, the Schaefer's, Southern Schaefer's and Northern Schaefer's, uh, they do not, the hair do not have much of a patterns at all. And the Japanese beetles have that V-shaped hair patterns at the end, and May and June beetle have that zipper looking patterns, and Green June beetles up here have also have a zipper type of patterns, but much more compact and close together. Let's talk about individual species one at a time, and so we can uh, so we can figure out some of the talk about some of the biology as well. Uh, the shapers, it, both the northern and the southern southern shapers are perhaps one of the most important species we have in South Carolina and perhaps the south, south as well. Their importance probably diminish as they move north. These beetles are pretty indescribable, uh, indistinctive. You have a very much a brownish beetle. Sometimes you have some of the black spot, like a blackish head, and that's about it. But these beetles, the adults are pretty difficult to identify. They are pretty common when it comes to when it comes to comes to the comes to the light. Uh, the easy way to identify them probably is based on uh, the white grubs. If you dig up some white grubs from the turf and you look up the look at the area end, and there's no distinctive CD or hair patterns on the rear end, then you probably have some sort of shafers either northern shapers or southern shapers. In South Carolina, we have both species. And they have a one-year life cycle. Now, there's a very important information here. Another group is the May or June beetle. These are the Philophaga. This is a huge group. Uh, I believe in Florida it's alone, there are probably close to 60 species of Philophaga. So there's a few of them around. And they all look like this. Brackish, brownish, and sometimes reddish. Again, adults are very difficult to tell. And immature would be a better way to identify. Immature have that zipper amount of uh, hair on the rear end. So you can actually figure out. Uh, if you see a white grub that have that kind of zipper patterns, then you know it's a phyloxica. And phyloxica typically have a two year life cycle. Some species have one year have uh, three years. So they're a little bit different from the one-year uh, grubs. Japanese beetles, adults are pretty distinctive. Uh, I do not need to talk too much about them. You know what they look like. And the white grubs have that V-shaped rastal patterns. Uh, the color picture is a little bit hard to tell, but the line drawing show that V-shape a lot better. Um, they have one-year life cycle. And the adults are serious pests, not just uh, adults 
is a serious pest on landscape and fruit trees. Um, they fly from May to June or May to August, and they basically feed on the leaves, feed on the uh, flowers. Uh, immatures are white grubs that feed on the turf. So both adults and immatures can cause a lot of issues. Now that is very different from say Schaefer's or May and June beetle. Typically May and June beetle, even though the adult feed, they do not cause a, whole, cause a lot of problem. The Schaefer's adults do not feed, um, so they don't usually cause a lot of problem there as well. But in beetles, both the adult and the immatures will feed and cause problems. Black turf grass in tedious, uh, in the, in the lawn situation, it's not a huge issue, but it will sometimes become a pest on, uh, golf course greens. They are typically, uh, the, they, they thrive on thatch. They love to feed on thatch, especially those, um, moist and compact thatch. And these are the adults on the top, very, very small beetles. And the immatures can be identified by two relatively big patch on the end of the abdomen. And they have two generations per year. Um, most damage are most severe in July and August. Green June beetle, uh, probably something that the uh, layman would be most uh, familiar with. These are the adult, uh, these are the big beetles, big beetles that people tie their string to the legs and let them buzz around. Um, unfortunately, our youngsters, our teenagers these days really do not have the experience of doing that. Oh, what a shame though. They're fun. Uh, adults are fun. They're a lot bigger than adult children. But they're really a sporadic pest of turf grass. Most of the time, the white grubs of green change beetles become an issue when the turf is very, very high in organic matters. Um, they do not typically feed on root itself, but sometimes can work. Most of the time, the, the larvae are huge. When they are, when they are mature, they're usually about one and a half inch long. Uh, it's a big, big one. And one thing to tell the grubs away, uh, um, from the other grub, white grub species, um, size is one thing. Another thing is they are the only species that will crawl on the back. And they are a huge issue. They don't typically feed on the root, but they will cause some damage to the turf, mostly because of their tunneling activity. Uh, the green gene beetle grubs, they will come up to the surface at night sometimes, especially after rain, I believe. And they will make a big old hole in the turf and then push up a lot of dirt. And the hole could be as big as a, so they are pretty good size. Uh, and they will come out, crawl on their back, and then climb around, and then a lot of time they were not they are not able to find their way back into the turf and crawl back into the turf again, so they ended up dying on the sidewalk on the road, dying in the ditch, and because these white grubs are so big when they die, when they decompose, they actually smell pretty awful, so that's another issue that's uh, related to 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 them uh, as a pest problem. Some of, some of the occasional uh, pest issue that we have, including Asiatic garden beetle. It's a very common beetle species we have in South Carolina, but not, uh, haven't seen a lot of damage uh, because of them. But they will feed on uh, turf grass as well. One of the characteristics that they have is that swollen, um, swollen part. Let me show you. Oh, shown on that red arrow or that green arrow. Uh, it's that swollen tug on the side of the mouth. When you see something like that, it's uh, pretty sure that it's an Asiatic garden beetle. For those in the northeast, uh, you guys have to deal with oriental beetle quite a bit. And this is a doubt. Very big, but they do have that molding. Uh-oh, what happened? All right, they do have that molding color to that. And the grubs have two rows of CDs at the, at the rear end as well, but they also have a very deep groove on the rear end, so you can tell the uh, white grubs away quite a bit. Now, this is a uh, pest species in the northeast. Uh, in the south, we don't see them very much at all. Black sugarcane beetle, uh, Euthiola. This is an adult. 
And for the past few years, uh, they have been causing a lot of concern because they showed up in humongous number. A lot of times they're born into the turf and then they start digging around and expose the turf to desiccation and cause a lot of issues. And another issue that's associated with the sugar black sugar cane beetle is they also bore into structures, drywall, caulking, and whatnot, wherever they can find. For a while, they actually become both a turf pest and also a, uh, a structural pest. Um, a very distinct um, status, I guess. The last history is very interesting. They have uh, two peaks. The first peak happens in that's when the overwintering, overwintering adults starting to emerge from the soil, fly around and deposit eggs. Their grubs feed under the ground on decaying matters or in, in roots. And then in about August, they, the immatures become adult and they fly out from the turf. And when they do that, you can collect them. After a while, they just kind of go into dormancy. Next year, they come right back in May uh, to fly around again. All right, well, I mentioned to you this particular statement. The next thing, the next caveat we need to do is the best result. The best result really re is related to the management or the treatment of your, of your turf and what do you expect out of that. What is your definition of best treatment, best result? Um, is it absolutely zero growth? If your definition of a good result is zero grubs, then I can tell you that that's going to be very difficult to achieve. Uh, I would even go as far as saying it's not achievable at all. You just have to kind of tolerate some of the damage. Uh, if you are okay with some of the damage, how much of the damage can you tolerate? So that would be the next question that you have to ask. But before, to the uh, best result, uh, before we get into uh, management, I kind of have to Say something about pests, I guess. Um, the classical definition of pests, of course, is any organism that's unwanted or undesirable. It could be a weed, it could be a pathogen or insect or some sort of wildlife. But a pest is not always a pest. Of the presence of an organism, for example, this big two-eyed click beetle, does not necessarily mean that it is a pest. So when you or you collected some of these big to I click beetle, there's really no reason to make any kind of treatment at all. But, and also, if you have a pest that shown up at a place that doesn't really matter, it is not a pest either. So for example, this backworm, it's a huge issue on cypress or evergreens, but if it shows on a tire which it doesn't feed on, that really it's not causing any kind of damage, so it is not a pest. In this kind of situation, you really do not need to make any kind of treatment at all. But when you do need to make a kind of treatment, you kind of have to make a good decision as to when the management is really needed. We talk about economic uh, injury level and the economic threshold and, and all that. Uh, the idea is very simple, basically is, if it passed a level of, if the number of pests passed a certain level, which is economic injury level, before that, you want to uh, apply some kind of management, uh, some kind of treatment, so that the pest population can be reduced again. Now, in the turf grass situation, it's going to be very difficult because this economic injury level is up here. It, on ornamental plants and turf grass where aesthetic is everything, a lot of times, the economic enrichment level is further down here. Sometimes it's zero. That makes, uh, that makes it very difficult for us to actually determine when a, a treatment is needed. And that created a situation where um, man management is, is applied whenever a pass is, is found. In some situations, that's warranted, particularly if that pass carries some kind of plant, plant viruses and that would not be tolerated. And in some situations, that probably is a, a low level of pest is probably acceptable. For white grubs, the turf can actually survive quite a bit of, uh, can, can, can tolerate some of the, uh, some of the, 
some of the white grubs feeding on the root if you maintain the turf well enough. In a well-managed, well-maintained turf in South, we have several thresholds that's already been established. The Japanese beetles is about six to eight grubs per square foot. Well, the turf can tolerate up to 10, but six to eight, six to eight is where we typically recommend on when you initiate treatment. Mass shapers is about eight grubs. May and June beetle being a little bit bigger grubs, it's about four to five. Green beetles, well, even though they are huge, they don't feed on the turf grass roots, um, but they do cause some structural damage, so there's also a treatment level for it. And this kind of treatment level, this, this kind of treatment level typically change depending on what disease you are dealing with and also where you are. Some of the situation, if you have a very high value turf, you might have a much lower um, threshold than this. The next issue is, the next issue is, did I hear something? All right. The next issue is uh, damage. Where are the damage? Sometimes some of the issue, some of the pests could have a clump uh, uh, distribution, meaning that they only attack one corner over there. Some of them has a much spread out um, distribution, as in this picture. Could be here, could be there, could be there, could be there. Now, your experience dealing, each different pest species will have a very different distribution. So, um, and some of, uh, some of them will have clump distribution, some of them would be scattered. That would, that would really depend on the pest you deal with, and also your experience. Uh, if you deal with a white grub before, you're probably going to know that it's a very, very much of a clump distribution. They, are, they typically showed up in one corner or one area of the lawn. Um, so you can, your experience will really tell you when the problem is going to show up. So always keep a good record. Get a notebook. Write down what happened this year, when it, when the problem first showed up, where it is, and whether it actually showed up in the same area. So if you have to treat only the hot spot, or you end up have to treating the entire area. And of course, what is the problem? Well, what is causing the problem? Um, very importantly, what did you do? What kind of treatment you apply? Is it insecticide? Is it cultural control? Is it irrigation or something else? on whether the control method is effective or not, and when you apply it, and whether, whether, you, whether, you, whether you want to, whether it's effective or not, or whether you could replicate it next year. So all this, all this information you write down in the notebook, you refer back to it later on, and then you, know, you can just kind of plan next year's or this year's uh, management program based on what happened last year. So keep a good record. Is it will come back and help you. Um, for those of you that actually works in the uh, commercial setting, uh, landscaping or, white, uh, or golf courses or stuff, um, oh, I always recommend doing a pest outlook board. What is that? Is, what it is is basically a whiteboard saying that, oh, this is May. The Japanese beetles are going to start flying, so look out for them, so that you can actually tell your employee to be out there uh, keeping an eye on things because they are out there all the time and they look at the plants all the time and they always notice something. So if you can train your employee on what to look for, when to look for things, where to look for things, they might be able to report back to you so that you can apply the treatment just on time to deal with the past uh, at the efficacy that you would like to have. Um, the next issue is what's is life stage you need to figure out what life stages so that you can find the most effective time to, to treat again like I say the uh, the little guys are a lot easier to treat than the big ones and the big ones sometimes you just have to deal with them in a very drastic matters the next caveat we're going to talk about is what what do you have in the shed is the insecticide the only thing you, you have? Sometimes 22 is probably the best way to deal with them. Sometimes not. Uh, 
um, for the tanners and ornamental industry, a lot of time what we use are insecticides. Now, insecticide, again, I have to say, can be dangerous, so you have to use it very, very carefully. And all the insecticides that's out there, they are not created equal. Some of the insects are effective against certain species of pests, and some of them are not. So you need to use the most appropriate pesticide and use them in the most appropriate way. So there you get the most efficacy. Now, when I think about the efficacy in the commercial setting, it's about time. It's about labor. If you can treat it for just once instead of multiple times by using the right product at the right time, you can save yourself a lot of money and time. And these are the insecticides that, that are labeled for application against white grubs. Um, by the commercial applicators. Some of them are quite uh, familiar to you. For example, uh, Carbaro, which is, and this, this register for use against white grubs in uh, G is for golf course. L is both commercial and residential. You need to check the label to see which use site it is. And R is recreational turf, for example, spots, uh, park and recreation, and also uh, athletic fields. Uh, the next product is Alipol. It's a relatively new pesticide, and uh, it's acetylprin. And the, the, the relative of chlorantranilipol is cyantranilipol. This, this particular product is called Freelance. It has just been introduced by Syngenta last year. And there's another group called the neonicotinoid. These are the uh, chlorantranilipol. Uh, the crotianacin, excuse me, and also dinotefran, imidacloprid, and dimetoxin. So these are the ones that you uh, can with. And halofenazate, this is an insect growth regulator, um, typically formulated as a granular applied to the soil, and it would only take effect if the uh, insects, the white grubs, feed on it, and then it uh, hunt the growth of the uh, White grubs. Trichrophones or Dilox is an old chemical. And the one is actually used uh, quite effectively against white grubs. I'll talk about about that in a little bit. Uh, Trichrophone is an organophosphate. Here are some of the insecticides for homeowners. Carbaro, again, uh, seven or Bayer complete. And chlorantronilipol in grub X. Grub X used to control trichrophone, but they have changed the formulation for chlorantronilipol. And then you have the three neonicotinoid, uh, chlorantronilipol, dinotefran, and imidacloprid in different kind of uh, uh, products. Oh, there's a question about what does S stand for. Let me address that right now. S means thought form. So let's go back, do it right. All right, let's talk about management of the white grubs. Um, the first thing, first lesson about management of white grub is you need to select the most effective insecticide based on the season. And what I mean by season is really the timing of the adult flight. Uh, you need to, well, if you, are, you can do it in two ways. The one way is doing it as a preventive management. You could, you could apply that in May or June. A better way to look at it is you can apply it when the adults are flying. You can apply them as neonicotinoid or as chlorantronilipol or diamines, chlorantronilipol or cyanotronilipol. And unfortunately, this, the preventive is the most effective way to control white growth. Unfortunately, not everybody um, detects the white growth on time. And a lot of time, a lot of time I got the calls from panic people just calling me and saying, oh, I got white growth. And that's typically in August when the uh, grubs are getting big and difficult to control but become much more uh, uh, much more noticeable. And you, enter, you have to switch it to a curative uh, mode and using organophosphate or carbamate as the uh, 
as the as the chemical of choice. All right, let's talk about the uh, timing of your treatment using the life cycle of the Japanese beetles as an example. Um, the typical life, life cycle of the Japanese beetles. The adults become active in late May all the way into August, but most of them in June, July. They start laying eggs, and then the first the first instar typically showed up in late June. Second instar showed up about July. Third instar typically showed up in the middle of August. Now, this is in South Carolina, of course. And again, like I say, first and second instar white grubs are a lot easier to control than the third instar. So, depending on the life stages that you have, you have to run, you have to apply your preventive treatment in June and July when the adults are flying so that the, in, the neonicotinoid they supply and also the diamide that they supply actually kill off the eggs, the immatures, when they're the mo when they are most vulnerable. So typically if you apply preventive, you apply it early and it would deal with the little guys and it's quite effective. And of course the second option is to is to apply a curative treatment. Curative treatment is make uh, is target, targeted against second instar and also early third instar. These guys you can still control them with the new, uh, with the organophosphate and carbamate. When you have really big grubs in September and October, uh, the efficacy of most insecticide is very very poor. At that time, I do not think about controlling them anymore. You're basically wasting your time wasting your money and just, unfortunately, you just have to let them be, allow them to emerge next year, but apply a preventive insecticide next year to stop them from, um, for, to stop your offspring from developing in the same turf next year. All right, here are some of the chemicals that you could use for that. Uh, let's see, neonicotinoids right here for preventive, glandrin, cyanotrin, Curative, um, like I say, you have to you apply it later in the year. You have to use some of the more nastier product, for example, organophosphate and carbamate. And neo, among the neonicotinoid, uh, clothianotin seems to work better for me as a curative. But again, it's always more effective to apply them as a preventive treatment. Already talked about that. So the question is, if you apply as a preventive treatment, but the adults are active for two months and they lay eggs in June and July, would one application in June have to control everything in the back? And I've, I've done some I have done some in, um, work before looking at the longevity of the neonicotinoid and diamides just to see how long one application would last against adult and also against eggs and immature white grubs. So what happened is if you apply one application in early June, the longevity that would last until um, early August, at least 45 or 60 days. So that is more than enough to provide you with a good um, residual longevity against the immature grubs um, for the entire season. Another issue when we think about uh, insecticide treatment for against grub is that, well, how you you have to do something else later on to deal with the grubs. Let me see if I can get that right. All right, so a lot of time when I look at the turf. Uh, look at the profile of the turf. Typically, divide them in half. You have a lot of insects feeding. Some of them feeding on the top, like those, uh, like those uh, uh, caterpillars up here. Some of them feeding under underground. For example, these white grubs. And what you do after insecticide treatment means a lot to the efficacy of those treatments. Here's what I mean. You can divide the turf into half the grass plus park and also the thatch and everything underneath it. For insects that feed on the, the blade, 
for example, the caterpillars, you should avoid irrigation for at least 24 hours so that they can get in contact with the insecticide that you apply to the top. For those that feed underneath, you want to water in soon after the application so that the insecticide can, percolate, can go through the soil profile and get down there to where the grubs are feeding. So for grubs, one thing that always helps with uh, increased management is you want to make sure after application, you water in so that the uh, insecticide will go down to the soil surface. Life cycle of the uh, grubs means a lot of difference as far as how many times you want to apply it. Annual grubs, for example, the Japanese beetles, a one generation lasts for a whole year. And typically, if you apply a preventive treatment against the young grubs, basically cut off the life cycle. You basically have, if you do it right, if you control it well, you, there's not going to be enough of the white grubs until next year to cause problems. So one application typically would do the job. But for those that have multiple life cycle, for example, the fire Africa, the male and June beetle, which have two or three year life cycle, you may actually need two or more applications because the first preventive treatments you can kill ones, but you cannot but you cannot kill the big ones down here. Let me put it another way. In a typical population under the soil, at any given time, if you have phylophagus species, you have a population of all different sizes. So one application you can kill off the little ones. But the little but the big ones are still there. Those big ones, you just have to let them uh, emerge and then deal with them next year to kill them. I hope I make it clear, but I ask questions I'm not making quite re uh, clear later on. Um, is insecticide the only option? No. Uh, insecticide is definitely one, should be the backup, should be the backup, should be in the backup position because the, the first thing that you need to do when you do, when it comes to white guard management, is to create a turf that's healthy. Healthy grass typically means they can tolerate a lot more issues with pests. And also, healthy grass and healthy ecosystem will give you a lot more uh, natural enemies to deal with the pest problem, so you have less issues later on. Now, biological control, uh, often you often help to reduce infestation because before it becomes a big problem. For those of you uh, paid more attention, you're probably going to see a lot of these, um, these wasps, black body, blue wings, and, and red axes. You see a lot of those. Those are actually wasps that will parasitize microbes. So whatever you can do to keep them around, they will be the best. And a lot of time, uh, you also heard about or even use milky spores. Uh, it's definitely uh, in other options. I, tip, I personally do not typically recommend milky spores because I've never seen very, very good result with them. All right, I believe that's the uh, end of my presentation. And there might be quite a few questions out there. Ken? Okay, thank you very much. And we do have a question. I saw one pop up earlier, and uh, Kathy said we'd wait till the end. but. Julie asked, uh, if there is an infestation of these beetles we are talking about on our flowers, does this mean these things are actually in our turf? So if we take care to treat our lawns, we are also protecting our garden. That's, a, that's actually controlling grub worms. That actually is a very, very good question. And I have seen the, the short answer to that is yes. Because a lot of time what you ended up having, for, for example, Japanese beetles. You are growing some um, attractive plant, for example, roses or crepe myrtles. You might end up attracting a good population of them there. Um, in one of the cases that I deal with uh, over the years is one of the sod farms, they, they grow Bermuda grass, and right next to the sod farm, they have two rows of beautiful crepe myrtles. Crepe myrtles, of course, is very, very attractive to Japanese beetles and other species. So the Japanese beetle got attracted to it. When they are done feeding on the flowers, feeding on the leaves, they go right back into um, laying eggs in the turf. So the salt farmers ended up having more issues with Japanese beetles down the road. Yes, 
there is definitely a direct link between what you grow and what you what you ended up having. So one of the one of the jokes that I always make is, well, you know, instead of growing Japan, uh, instead of growing crepe myrtles or roses, which attract Japanese beetles, why don't people just grow holly or boxwood? But of course, that that will never fly because people just like their flowers. That's right, but but it it has a lot to do too with the plants that you have in your landscape. It's how attractive your yard is going to be to those Japanese beetles. Um, another, and this was a couple of questions that came to my mind. We see what the Japanese beetles do in the in, in, in the soil. Having a few Japanese beetles can actually actually be beneficial to the soil and aerating it and adding organic material. Is that right? Well, the question is, if you have the Japanese beetles in the soil, would it help to aerify the soil and and help with the organic matters? Um, well, I don't know. I yeah, don't have my, my question was with that. Yeah, my my question was in their movement in the soil. If you don't have enough that are damaging the turf grass, they become somewhat beneficial in aerating the soil. Their activity in the soil aerates the soil and adds organic material through their depositions and things. Would that be uh, accurate? I I do not know the answer to that, Dan. Can okay. Um, it, okay. They could be if you. They could be, but there's not. There's really no study that I know of to see how much uh, movement they how make in the soil actually. Very good, okay. And then the other one, because I saw this question pop up quite a bit, um, is with you mentioned the neonicotinoids, and uh, there has been concern put out uh, about the effects of neonicotinoids on the bee population. Can you touch on that a little bit? Certainly. Um, neonicotinoid has become a huge, uh, the effect of neonicotinoid on bees has become a huge issue. Um, in turf, even though we, the, even though pollinators of bees do not really visit turf for the sake of visiting turf, but we do see them quite a bit. Since we have a lot of flowering wheat in in the in 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 the in the in the, in the turf. Now, and in South Carolina, what I notice is also that we grow a lot of sand pea grass, and if we right. do not mow it often enough, we are going to end up seeing a lot of pollinators coming to the sand pea. Grass. So, if you use neonicotinoid to control white grubs in turf situation, you have to take, take a lot of precaution. First, you do not want to apply neonicotinoid when the bees are foraging. So you probably want to make, apply it later in the evening or very early in the morning. The second thing is what you do after application. Um, I believe in the chat box there's quite a few things that have been mentioned. Now, the one of the thing, one of the things that one of the very good study that have been done by Dr. Dan Potter in Kentucky is to show that if you apply uh, one particular neonicotinoid, which is called the to the turf, and then and then right after application, you mow the lawn and get rid of all the flowering clover, you ended up not having a lot of impact on the pollinators. So one thing that we can use pollinator, a uh, risk to the pollinator, is to mow the lawn after after application to get rid of right. whatever okay. present presenting there. And the third thing, also from Dr. Potter's study, is that there are other options used to have much lower toxicity to bees. For example, colantronilipo or, or asaloprin or grub X in his study have absolutely no effect on the survival of bees at all. So that would be another good option to replace neonicotinoid when it comes to management okay. of white growth. Very good. Uh, and we've got another question here from Ken G. Does leaving grass trimming on lawns have an impact on beetles one way or the other? Right, that's a good question too, Kenji. Um, the short answer to that is I do not know. There's not been any study to look at that. But 
if we're looking, if we're thinking, thinking about, uh, I'm assuming that when Ken G mentioning it is that the uh, neo nicotine will apply to the uh, to the grass trimming. If we put it on the lawn, and then would that leach out from the from the trimming, get back into the lawn? We have not done any study, or I do not, I'm not aware of any study if that's happening. Um, right. But typically, typically it. One of the studies I've, I've done before is we apply neonicotinoid, and it does not have any influence on the adult beetle whatsoever. The adult right. beetle can go into the soil that has already been treated with neonicotinoid. It would lay eggs just fine. It would come right back out just fine. It fly away, no problem. It feed on crepe myrtle, no problem. So it has absolutely no impact on the adult beetles. But does it have any impact on the grubs that's feeding in the ground? I do not know. That's something that we okay. probably need to get to. Right, and I think I think his question was not necessarily with the uh, neonicotinoids, but just the fact of leaving your grass clippings instead of bagging them. Is that going to increase, decrease, or have no effect on the amount of uh, grub worm activity you'll have in your lawn? That we do not know. Again, that's one of the questions that we haven't looked into. Okay. But Very typically, good. typically most insecticides bound to when bound to the organic matter is quite tightly. So usually, if you have, depends on what kind of insecticide you use, some of the insecticide will not be released from that tissue again. So it might not go back to the soil and have any okay. kind of impact on the on the on the grubs. Very good. All right, I don't see any other questions popping up right now. And uh, JC, thank you very much. That was an outstanding, uh, informative presentation. Thank you for helping us out with that. And for those who are still listening, if you would, be sure to look at the information here on this slide that you can see now. And at some point, go to that uh, link and participate in the survey and the evaluation. And we thank you very much for joining us today. And JC, do you have any other, anything else to add? No, I do not. I wish everybody have a good day. All right. Very good. Thank you. And thank you all again for tuning in.